Okay, this was taking place when Jesus' brothers had gone on ahead of him. They were getting ready for a celebration of the Festival of Shelters in Judea, and he didn't want to go, so he kind of held back, and they all went ahead of him, and now he's, he's going. So that's where we pick it up in the story in uh, John chapter 7, starting with verse 10. However, after his brothers had left for the feast, he went also, not publicly, but in secret. Now at the feast, the Jews were watching for him and asking, Where is that man? Among the crowds, there was widespread whispering about him. Some said, He's a good man. Others replied, No, he deceives the people. But no one would say anything publicly about him for fear of the Jews. Not until halfway through the feast did Jesus go up to the temple courts and begin to teach. The Jews were amazed and asked, How did this man get such learning without having studied? Jesus answered, My teaching is not my own. It comes from him who sent me. If anyone chooses to do God's will, he will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. He who speaks on his own does so to gain honor for himself. But he who works for the honor of the one who sent him is a man of truth. There is nothing false about him. Has not Moses given you the law? Yet not one of you keeps the law. Why are you trying to kill me? You are demon-possessed, the crowd answered. Who is trying to kill you? Jesus said to them, I did one miracle, and you're all astonished. Yet, because Moses gave you circumcision, though actually it did not come from Moses, but from the patriarchs, you circumcise a child on the Sabbath. Now, if a child can be circumcised on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses may not be broken, why are you angry with me for healing the whole man on the Sabbath? Stop judging by mere appearances and make a right judgment. All God's people said? Amen. First of all, you just got to love that video. I mean, those kids telling the story and what they catch and what they don't, what they... Uh, interject on their own. You know, uh, it really is uh, a mere image of adults. You know, I've run across, in all my years of ministry, I've run across quite a few adults that interject a lot into the scriptures or the their assumed understanding of the scriptures. Uh, and so, uh, it just changes as they get older. It's not so much... Jesus playing games in the tomb, but, uh, you know, I've actually had a guy tell me that, you know, just, you know I, don't, I don't worry about how I live this life. I, 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 Jesus and I work it out when, when I get up there. I said, that's a pretty big gamble. And I said, can you show me in the scriptures where that says that? Well, I know it's in there somewhere. So, yeah, I, I, those videos never get old. Thinking about this passage of Scripture came back to me, kept coming to me this week as I was thinking, okay, we finished that series, and that was a long series. You know, pastors, we like doing those series because you know exactly where you know God is leading you for the next message. And so we find some pastors, like myself, we begin to pray, okay, Lord, what do you want to speak to me this week about? And this one came, and it comes on the heels of what we've been talking about. There's some things that if you read this passage, and as Sue read it, we, we can think of some things that, uh, that we learned about. Just in the phrase... Uh, where he says, no, on the contrary. Where the people say, no, on the contrary, he deceives people. There are others that say, no, no, he's good. There are others that say, no, 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 he deceives people. And so there's, there's these multiple perceptions of Christ's motive 
The motives of Jesus are being questioned here. Even by his brothers in, in uh, chapter 6, uh, we, Jesus goes, he's in Galilee, uh, he is there with his brothers, and his brothers just tell him, leave town. Just leave. They are not among those who believe at that time. Now, after the resurrection, a little side note, after the resurrection, his brothers, all of them, become believers. You know? Of course, you know, seeing your brother crucified, and then three days later, seeing him walking around again, that kind of instills some assurance and certainty in you, doesn't it? That, that's a boost to your faith. And so... Jesus, they tell him, leave, uh, just go, and, uh, and but Jesus remains in Galilee. That's how uh, we pick it up in verse 9. He says that uh, he had said these things to, to uh, his brothers and to those around him, and uh, he remained in Galilee. Uh, but when his brothers went up for the Feast of the Tabernacles or the Feast of Shelters, this is a time where they commemorate the wandering in the wilderness. And so it, it, it kind of reminds me as, as a kid growing up uh, in a tradition that had camp meeting. It kind of reminds you of camp meeting. You know, uh, camp meeting came every July and we would you'd see people with campers and tents. And we did the tent thing a while, didn't we? We did it one year. We did four kids in a tent. <laughs> That was not a good time. And it rained like cats and dogs were part of it. We ended up packing up the tent and, you know, getting out of there early. Of course, we only lived 12 miles from the camp meeting grounds, so we could just go home. But that wasn't, you, you, then you're not involved in all the excitement and, you know, the campfires at night and the singing and all of that good stuff that goes on. And that's kind of what. Uh, the Feast of Tabernacles was. It was a commemoration of the Jews wandering in the wilderness and God leading them through. And so they would take and set up shelters, set up tents, and they would camp out. Sounds like fun, doesn't it? Yeah. I find it interesting. There's a couple of things that jump out to me here. Uh, Jesus, it says that as his brothers went out and, and went up and set up their tents and went out to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. Then it says that Jesus also uh, went to worship, but did so in secret. We don't see a lot of, of Jesus' activities done in secret. But it says that he knew that the Jews, the, and the, when they refer to the Jews, they're not talking about the group of people, they're talking about the group of Jewish leadership, those religious leaders who had all of the degrees behind their name, they had the they would be the, the equivalent of the PhDs and, and all of that today that we have. We give a lot of respect to those people and they they deserve it. It's not easy to get a PhD, it's not easy to get a master's degree, it's not it's not all that easy to get a bachelor's degree in in some cases. So we give, we give a certain amount of respect to those who, who've gone through that discipline and they get that, that degree handed to them. But uh, we were was, we was sharing, I, don't, I forget who we were talking with, Dawn, this week, but we were talking about uh, uh, a guy that I was in ministry with. His church was five miles away from us. We were in Middleville, uh, Michigan. Middleville, Michigan, we pastored a church that was further out in the middle of nowhere, then all. <laughs> you just asked my wife. For the first month we were there, she got lost every time she went to church. And that was for cell phones. You know? And so we, we was out there, and it was a great place. Dan, I had one Sunday morning, I had a, the biggest buck come and, and stare right in the church window at me. At the back, the, I was up front, and, and I was preaching, and then there was a long pause. As this big buck with a nice rack just poked his head right in the, 
right up, almost had his nose pressed against the window, it seemed. That's how far out it was. Dirt road, woods, nothing happening out there. But God began to bless and it began to grow. There, we started with 17 people, and at the end of that first year, we were averaging 133 people coming out in the middle of, of the woods, uh, out in the middle of nowhere, to worship the Lord. And I tell you this story because uh, I dealt with a personality of a, a fellow minister who we go to. I go to breakfast with him. Usually, we get together maybe once a week, once every other week. And uh, he had great degrees. I did not. I just, man, I once I was done with school, I had no intention of going on. I just wanted to get out there and get at it. And and so we meet. We meet at this little cafe in Middleville in the little town where I was pastoring and he would come from his town five miles away Caledonia, he would come and we would meet and, and uh, he's a great guy, he loved golf uh, I hated golf we'd go golfing and it was painful for him, I know, to golf with me uh, I, like, I like being out there, I like, but I like playing softball and if you are a softball player, you usually don't make a good golfer because you can't hit a golf ball like you do a softball. <clears throat> they go that way, they go that way. Uh, one went straight up. I was like, it didn't feel fly. <laughs> uh, so it was painful for him uh, to golf with me. But we went out and we talked. And, and I remember we were sitting in this cafe one day. And he had a brand new church plan. Our denomination, our district, and a... And one of the local churches in Grand Rapids had just poured a lot of money into this church plant. The pastor of the large church invited him for a year. He went there and the pastor said, steal as many of my people as you want, as you can get to go with you to plant this church. So they planted this church with about 60, 70 people in Caledonia, five miles away from Middleville. And he did it. He had the credentials. He had a master's degree from Trinity in Chicago. He actually was instructed by uh, uh, Robert Colson, Coleman, who wrote the book Master Plan of Evangelism. He studied under him and apprenticed under him. And, and he, had, he had a pedigree that was impeccable. And I remember the day we sat in that cafe and he, he pounded his hand on the table in frustration. He said, Jeff, I don't get it. I don't get it. I said, what well, don't you get? He says, all you have is a bachelor's degree. He said, your church is growing. He says, I've got a master's. I studied with Robert Coleman. I, 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 his church went from 70 to about 30. That's not church growth. And he looked at me and he says, I don't get it. I said, let me ask you this. How do you identify with your people? October 1. Anybody know the significance of October 1? Probably not so much in Kansas, but everybody knows the significance of October 1st in Michigan is the opening day of bow season. I said, opening day bow season. How many did you have at church? He said, I barely had people there. He said, I had all women. All my guys went out bow hunting. He says, I don't get it. He says, I even told him, I don't get this. You go out and sit in a tree and wait for a deer to pass by so you can shoot a bow and arrow at it. I said, did you tell that to your congregation? Yeah. I said, that doesn't do well for church growth. It doesn't do well for you as a pastor to identify with your people. I said, do you ever think about going bow hunting? What? Now, he says, don't you have bow hunters in your church? I said, yes, I do. 
And I said, the weeks previous, I get them all excited about bow hunting. But I said, I have no qualms. I said, I tell them, you can go bow hunting on Sunday morning, feel free. But you ain't going to see a deer until about 1 o'clock in the afternoon, so you might as well come to church. <laughs> and I've had guys come to me and say, because I'll ask them, see them, hey, how'd you do this week? Did you, see, did you get something? No, I didn't see a thing Sunday. <laughs> I just smile and say, I told you. Do not mess with God's timing, His day. I said, I just tell you, you can go out in the afternoon and you will see deer. You can go out in the evening. But I said, you go out on Sunday morning, I said, you're more than welcome to. I said, we still count you as being in church. But I said, are you really worshiping God? Are you giving Him honor? You know what? Over time, my men gave up a Sunday morning boat hunt and went to Sunday afternoon and evening. Now, when you live in a county that has 15 deer per square mile, your chances of seeing them on Sunday afternoon are fairly good. Okay? But I, I tell you that because when I read this passage, I think of my colleague who... He depended more on his pedigree, his knowledge, the information that he had in his head, rather than the love that he had in his heart for people. I'll be quite honest with you. When I, I did not, I fought and kicked going into the ministry because I did not want to become one of the religious. And so my prayer was, God, I will do this. My deal with God is, I will do this if you let me be who you created me to be. And God said, sure, I don't want you to change. And what we see here is Jesus, and they even say this. Look at what they say in verse, um, let me see here, here we go. Get it down here. They were astonished that he had no formal training. Their struggle was that he did not go to the school of Pharisees and Sadducees. He did not go to the religious formal training and yet people called him rabbi. Would that bother you? Be, stop and be honest. Would that bother you? I jokingly, uh, I'll, I'll use Pastor Dawn. I call her Pastor Dawn because she uh, has that gift of, of communication. That is, uh, that is a sincere uh, uh, term of endearment for her willingness to serve Christ in that way. Doesn't bother me to say that. Just because she doesn't have the degrees, or Rod doesn't have the degrees, or Kevin, or anybody else, Clint, just because they don't have the degrees do, does not make their ministry, it does not nullify it, it does not diminish it, it does not make a difference, one iota to me, because every one of you in here are called to be pastors. You're called a priesthood of believers. When we go through uh, the Emmaus talks, we have a talk about the priesthood of believers. I knew about that well before I went to Emmaus. Because that is what you and I are called to do. My job, I'm a part of the priesthood of believers too. But my job, according to uh, Ephesians, Paul's letter to the Ephesians, my job is to train you all to do the work of the ministry. You do not give me a salary to do the ministry for you. You, you give me a salary. You call me to be your pastor to train you to do the work of the ministry. To get your perception 
uh, to, to get focused on other people, to see what you have about you, your lifestyle, your hobbies, everything about you can be used to win people to Christ. If you love fishing, take someone with you. If you love hunting, take someone with you. If you like working cattle and being a cowboy, take someone with you. That is what discipleship is. And so these Jesus got these disciples, he's got crowds following him. In fact, uh, they were really ticked. What really ticked them off is, is in John chapter 5, a few chapters uh, uh, previous, he healed a crippled man at the pool of Bethsaida. He healed him, and it happened to be on the Sabbath. And that's why Jesus was talking about, you will circumcise on the Sabbath, and that comes from the patriarchs. That comes from Abraham. You think it comes from Moses, but it really came from Abraham. And when Jesus said that, he was making a point that you don't even pay attention to your own history, to the origins of where your own ceremonies come from. You give credit to Moses for, for the circumcision because Moses gave the law. And you're all about the law, but you don't even obey it yourself. Huh? This is, this is where Jesus does not back down. He understands who he is dealing with. And so he says, you get upset with me because uh, I heal somebody and make their body whole and it happens to be on the Sabbath. But yet you will circumcise on the Sabbath. And that doesn't even come from, uh, from, from the father necessarily. It comes from Abraham. That's who originated that. He says, that doesn't make one iota of difference of healing in the body. That just identifies them as a part of the Jewish people. That's basically what he's saying. He's saying, but I heal somebody and make their body whole, and you got a problem with it. Man, have you ever run across those people? Have you ever run across somebody who, in, that appearance is about everything? The way we dress. How do you judge people? How do you size people up? Now I'm beginning to meddle. I understand. But how do, you, how do you judge people? You size them up. Used to be, used to be when I first got in there, when I was raised in church, you had to dress a certain way, you had to look a certain way, you had to talk a certain way to be a Christian. You couldn't engage in certain activities because not that they were there was anything uh, uh, dubious about them, but because they identified. You couldn't go. How many here have ever shot pool on a pool table? How many have been to a pool hall? You see, there was a day when if they saw you at the pool hall. Oh, okay. If you went to church on Sunday and they saw you at the pool hall Saturday night, uh-oh, you must be here praying for forgiveness. My wife remembers when she had to wear a dress to church every Sunday. She wearing slacks. Brazen <laughs> Jesus came to break that, that stereotype of relationship or religious relationship with God. And he, he, had, he went directly to the point when he told the religious leaders, he said, look, you have the law, but you don't obey it yourself. You make other people obey it, but you don't obey it yourself. And his very last comment, do not judge according to appearance. But judge with what? Righteous judgment. They probably thought that's what we do because we're the righteous. But how many times in, and I can tell you in the minor prophets, Habakkuk, Hosea, 
where God says, I require mercy rather than sacrifice. Yet sacrifice was required by the law. But yet God said, there is something beyond the law. You can engage in sacrifice, but if you don't have a heart of mercy, if you don't have a heart of love, if you don't understand my grace, then your sacrifice means nothing. And so we a lot of times make judgments based on appearance. Every time I go and make a hospital call, and a few times I've been in shorts, uh, over the winter, I, I uh, because I don't particularly like the cold, so I wear uh, long johns. Not, I wear pants over them, don't, <laughs> don't worry. But uh, I wear jeans, I wear long johns, I wore boots, and I wear uh, usually some kind of a hat. Uh, I have my little, uh, they call it my golf hat. Uh, I, I have a, a Duck Commander camouflage hat that I wear quite a bit. And so uh, here is my standard when I go to make a, a hospital call, and I don't look like a preacher. Because I walk up and I ask for a room number and I give them the name and they look at me and they say, especially when I get up to the nurses station there in ICU, I need to. I'm here to see so and so, and they look at me and I know what they're thinking. Who are you? And why should we let you in? And so they look at me and I say, I'm a minister. I know I don't look like it, but I am. Trust me. And they always smile and say, oh, 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 no, no, we weren't thinking anything. Sure. <laughs> it was written across your forehead like a neon sign. And it, it's been a great, for me, a great opportunity to witness by the breaking of that mold. Because, listen, it doesn't matter whether I'm in a three-piece suit or if I'm in khaki shorts and flip-flops. That doesn't make ministry. What makes ministry is what comes out of us. That's the same for you. It's the same for any minister. It's what comes out of us. And our ministry isn't what we do. Our ministry starts, and we've got to go back to our learning triad, our ministry starts with how we think of other people. And when we begin to think of other people, as persons to love on behalf of Jesus Christ, then our behavior, our doing, matches up because it is driven by our belief that we are here on behalf of Jesus Christ to minister mercy, comfort, grace, even forgiveness sometimes. And so a lot of times people make these, and everybody judges on appearance. We have to be on guard because Satan will get us to where we become legalistic. And I have a, I have a little thing here that I take with me uh, often. Huh? What are y'all thinking? <laughs> I like it for bow hunting because it's small enough I can slip it in my pocket. See, you can just slide it right in there on my inside pocket. So when I'm bow hunting or up in the tree stand, I can just, un just quietly unzip that jacket and pull that out. And everybody says, oh, our pastor has problems. But what do we identify with, with this? Liquor. cranberry grape juice. But 
It is the appearance that everybody, first of all, judges me on. Understand something. Jesus told the, the Pharisees, He says, you guys worry about the outward when you should worry about the inside. Whoever, I mean, it's a great idea. It's flat. It fits in most pockets. I can put it in my back pocket. But I tell you what, the DS would be getting call after call after call if I carried this out in public in my back pocket if I walked down Marion Main Street and was swigging out of a flask. I tell you the truth, people would judge me. And it's grape juice. Exactly. <laughs> Jesus himself said, told the Pharisees, he says, John came, didn't, didn't eat or drink anything. He wore uh, a very modest clothing, weird but modest during those times. He didn't spend a lot of money on clothing or anything. He says, you call him evil. The Son of Man comes, he eats with sinners, drinks, wine. What do you call him? You see, a lot of times we, we base our decisions not on who they are on the inside, but what we see them struggling with on the outside. I wish there was a way in which we could help one another open up and share what we struggle with on the inside. Because what we do on the outside is an indication of many, much of the time of what we're struggling with on the inside. For years, I struggled with the idea that my father really really didn't, I thought for a while that he didn't love me because he never came to my ball game. He, he never played catch with me. I never caught one football pass from my father. I never caught one softball or baseball from my father. We, he, that is not who he was. And on the outside, I thought he didn't love me. But he was struggling with things on the inside. And it wasn't until he had a genuine encounter with Jesus Christ that he began to let go of everything that was hindering his outward behavior, that was enhancing the outward behavior. He would, he would have moments when he would, he would uh, get drunk. He would have moments when he would leave for days on end. Because of he was struggling with his uh, his demons on the inside, if you will. But it wasn't until a genuine encounter with Jesus Christ that he let those things go. And for everybody who would have seen my father holding one of these after he was saved, would have said, "Oh, he went back to his same old way." This is just a container. Just a container. You know what is important? What's on the inside. You and I, we are just containers. What is important is what's on the inside. Paul prays often. Fill us, fill me to a new measure of your fullness, Lord Jesus. Fill me to a new measure of fullness. Because he understood my life, this body is just a container. What is important is what's on the inside. What 
what's on the inside of you. Listen, don't worry about what people think about you outside. Behavior, past behavior, is past. Every day you and I wake up, we have an opportunity to start fresh and anew. But we will run into the same problems if we don't change what's on the inside. What I really like, what I... I I know you're going to probably say, Pastor Jeff, is that really right or wrong? I don't know if it's right or wrong, but I just really like it. I like shocking people. I like it when people say, you're a minister. That is like pouring gasoline on a fire. Because if anybody ever said, oh, you're a minister. Tell by the way you look. Oh my goodness. I don't want to be a minister because of what they see on the outside. I want them to declare, you're a minister, not by what I wear, not by uh, the label that I have on my car or, or on the bumper sticker or because of something that is on the outside. I want them to be aware that I am a minister of Jesus Christ because of what comes out. On the inside. You and I will struggle with this all of our walk. Because Jesus did. Guys. Everybody. It's Easter's over. I leaned over to Sue and said, everybody seems tired. The energy of the Holy Spirit. Where is it today? Did you have it yesterday? Last Sunday was electrifying in here. It's because we came with anticipation. Easter and Christmas should not be the only Sundays we come anticipating that God is going to do something new and fresh in our lives. Every Sunday. Every Sunday. We gather together every Sunday. We gather together to see what God is going to do. Not just individually in our lives, but collectively as a church family. <laughs> God help us. The day we look to coming to church on Sunday like we look forward to going to a family reunion. I've been to oh. They have, her side of the family had a lot of them. Used to them in Michigan. And she's got some weird people. <laughs> and I'd always say, yeah, we got to go see your cousin. They think my side's hillbilly. You ain't met a Michigan hillbilly until you met Don's family. They're fun. Gave me years and years of sermon illustrations before I ever knew I would be a minister. Guys, let Christ every day refresh what's on the inside. Don't put the cap on this and leave it sit on a shelf. Mm. What? That tastes good. You're thinking of the pie, aren't you? <laughs> I think it just turned on the TV on. <laughs> yeah. If you're now joining us by television, this is great news, by the way. If you don't believe me, come on down to the service. We'll give you a squeak. Doesn't the Bible say something about taste and see that the Lord is good?
Don't judge by the outward appearance, folks. Judge by what's on the inside. And you will make a right judgment, Jesus says. Stand. You've got to say something next service. <laughs> Father, we face many things in this life. Many things that the enemy will throw at us outside the walls of the church, outside of the communion and fellowship of your family. Satan will attack us. In this passage, Jesus shows us that sometimes the attacks come from those who we would never assume or believe that they should come from. Fellow believers, people who have an understanding of who you are, and yet still judge us according to standards set by themselves. Jesus said here, the doctrine that I bring is the doctrine given to me by the Father, not one I've made up of my own. He tells them to not judge by appearance, but to make a righteous judgment. A judgment from right understanding. And so for us to have a right understanding, we have to correct how we think. And so when we read your word, we need to read it through the eyes of your Holy Spirit and ask that you would help us to understand the true principle and the true meaning of what your word wants to tell us. Lord, change us from the inside out. And Lord, help us to be people who understand that we are all priests and pastors. And that everything in our life, whether it be farming, ranching, hunting, fishing, sowing, doesn't matter what it is. It can be used as a discipleship tool to bring others to you. Because discipleship is about relationships. Lord, help us to develop those. I thank you for these that are here now. In Christ's name, amen. We're going to sing a song. Uh, you probably figured that out. But it's, a, it's a great song. I first heard it uh, years and years ago.